Around the world, 500 million people demonstrated on the streets in 2019. The dream of a world without exploitation and oppression lives on. At the same time, the imperialist world system is heading toward a general societal crisis, and people are searching for fundamental alternatives. There is no alternative, say those in power. Their motive? The workers, the masses in the world, mustn't begin to question capitalism. There is, says Frederick Engels. He and Karl Marx develop the dream of the oppressed into a science, scientific socialism. Together they establish the proletarian world outlook. Frederick Engels is a great theoretician who simultaneously, in his revolutionary practice, was a leader of the revolutionary working class movement of his day. Born in 1820, against the will of his father, he did not become a capitalist, but a revolutionary. Frederick Engels is a classic of Marxism-Leninism, and yet he is perhaps the most unappreciated of the classics, even in the revolutionary and working class movement. The film challenges viewers to form their own picture of Frederick Engels' life work. It is thus part of the movement, don't give anti-communism a chance. And these are the stations of our Frederick Engels discovery tour. First, the often underestimated classic. Second, Frederick Engels and the working class movement. Third, Engels studies the dialectics of nature. Fourth, socialism from utopia to a science. Fifth, Engels, brilliant polemicist and his anti-during. Sixth, pioneer of the liberation of women. Seventh, from capitalist son to communist. Often Engels is described only as a helper, friend, or even financier of Karl Marx. In contrast, the leading thinker and co-founder of the MLPD, Willy Dickut, writes, Engels' role in elaborating the theory of dialectical and historical materialism is no lesser than that of Marx. Marx himself acknowledges Engels as one of the foremost representatives of contemporary socialism. He describes Engels as a veritable walking encyclopedia capable of working at any hour of the day or night. A fast writer and devilish quick in the uptake. Engels' contributions jointly with Marx, but also independently, to the elaboration of the proletarian world outlook, inseparably linked with the scientific polemics against bourgeois and petty bourgeois theoreticians, will endure for centuries. Trailblazing writings like Anti-During, Dialectics of Nature, The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State, or Ludwig Feuerbach and the End of Classical German Philosophy were penned by Engels. Together with Marx, he wrote the Manifesto of the Communist Party, the world's most frequently translated book next to the Bible. Karl Marx passed away on 14th of March 1883 at the age of just 64 before he was able to complete his great work, Capital. Without hesitating, Engels took charge of this task, putting works of his own on the back burner. He set about to elaborate the second and third volumes. This immense task took over 10 years as he alone was familiar with Marx's preparatory work. Moreover, after the death of Marx's wife Jenny, he was the only person who could read Marx's handwriting. On the peasant question, he also worked out the basic position of the communists still valid today. The most important works of Marx and Engels are published together in 50 volumes in English. Just the letters the two wrote number 4170. Engels could develop the revolutionary theory only because he was a practical leader of the class struggles. In 1841, he went to Berlin and did one year's voluntary military service with an artillery regiment. He increasingly was convinced that as a revolutionary he needed military skills. And very soon he did. In 
In 1848-49, a bourgeois revolution against the Prussian-dominated feudal regime took place. As member of a workers' association in Cologne, at a rally on the banks of the Rhine River, he calls on 10,000 workers to join the struggle for freedom. In May 1849, the Revolutionary Military Commission in Elberfeld empowers him to inspect the barricades against the advancing Prussian troops and to install artillery. However, the Bourgeois Committee of Public Safety finally called on him to leave town because, as Engels writes a few days later in the Neue Rheinische Zeitung, his presence evoked the utmost alarm of the Elberfeld bourgeoisie. They were afraid that at any moment he would proclaim a Red Republic. The workers of the Berg country are highly indignant and promise to protect Engels with their lives. If arrested, he faces summary execution. Sought by wanted notice, he escapes arrest. He makes his way to Baden, where he continues to fight as adjutant. The bourgeoisie betrays the workers and joins forces with the feudal princes. They bloodily suppress the revolution. Engels has to flee again, this time to Switzerland. He evaluates these struggles, studying in depth the first dialectician of military science, Karl von Clausewitz. And so he becomes the first military theoretician of the working class movement and is given the nickname the General. Frederick Engels had an inquisitive mind. He gains extensive knowledge in all fields of natural science, politics, philosophy and history. In thousands of letters he discusses and corresponds with representatives of the working class movement of Europe and America, with publishers, poets, or scientists, with Heine, Bebel, Liebknecht, Freiligrath, Bernstein, Kautsky or Schorlemmer. He writes articles for newspapers in many countries. He speaks 20 languages and can understand several more. He takes on duties in the international working class movement, traveling to France, Scotland, Norway and North America. All his life he put his extraordinary abilities into the service of the working class movement. It is the period of industrialization, of early capitalism. The power of the emperors and kings, the church and the nobility of feudalism has not yet been overcome. However, a new class contradiction already has been developing. The capitalists on the one hand and the working class, the proletariat, on the other. Frederick Engels is the eldest son of an aspiring textile capitalist. Young Frederick goes through life with eyes open. At the age of 19 he writes, Terrible poverty prevails among the lower classes, particularly the factory workers in Wuppertal. Frederick's father sends him to Manchester, England, to the partner firm Ehrman and Engels. But the rebellious son uses the time in England to learn about the situation of the workers. Every evening he goes to the bitterly poor quarters of the working class families and befriends them. He reflects on this experience in his first major work, The Condition of the Working Class in England from personal observation and authentic sources. In the preface, he writes about the origination of the book. I forsook the company and the dinner parties, the port wine and champagne of the middle classes and devoted my leisure hours almost exclusively to the intercourse with plain working men. I am both glad and proud of having done so. Glad because thus I obtained a knowledge of the realities of life Proud, because thus I got an opportunity of doing justice to an oppressed and calumniated class of men. He 
He studies and describes in detail how the triumphant progress of capitalism is based on ruthless exploitation of the workers. He is outraged that some factories employ mainly primary school-aged children because their hands are smaller and more nimble. Sooner even than Marx, Engels is first to see in the working class the only revolutionary class paying tribute in these words. All are united upon this point that they, as working men, a title of which they are proud, form a separate class with separate interests and principles, with a separate way of looking at things in contrast with that of all property owners, and that in this class reposes the strength and the capacity of development of the nation. Lenin writes in his Engels Obituary, Even before Engels, many people had described the sufferings of the proletariat. Engels was the first to say that the proletariat is not only a suffering class, that it is, in fact, the disgraceful economic condition of the proletariat that drives it irresistibly forward and compels it to fight for its ultimate emancipation. Frederick Engels realizes that the working class can bring its strength to bear only if organized. With Marx, in 1847, he joins the Secret League of the Just. Under their influence, it becomes the Communist League. It commissions the writing of the world-famous Manifesto of the Communist Party, which ends with the well-known words, Working men of all countries, unite. In London, in 1864, Marx and Engels play a significant role in founding the first International Working Men's Association. Education of the working class in the spirit of proletarian internationalism is its greatest historical achievement. The building of the international is marked by fierce struggles with various petty bourgeois currents. Engels polemicizes against the founder of anarchism, Bakunin. Engels calls the anarchists a sectarian movement which, with its ultra-revolutionary rentings, represents the stage of the infancy of the proletarian movement and as such must be overcome. Thirteen years later, in 1889, Engels helps some 400 delegates from working class organizations of 20 countries to found the second, the Socialist International in Paris. In memory of the struggle of the workers of Chicago for the eight-hour day, they declare the 1st of May an international day of struggle. On May Day 1890, Engels, who personally took part in all May Day celebrations into old age, writes Today, as I write these lines, the European and American proletariat is reviewing its fighting forces, mobilized for the first time, mobilized as one army under one flag. Frederick Engels, together with Marx, thus works out the leading and decisive role of the working class. Today's so-called postmodernism attacks precisely this leading role of the working class in the revolutionary movement. Explicitly directed also against Engels, the British university professor Paul Mason claims that it is no longer the working class that is the driving force of historical change, but the networked individual of the computer age. According to postmodernism, the working class is dying. However, Mr. Mason would be well advised to leave his post-capitalist university spaces for once and venture a glance into the big wide world. Because the working class, especially the international industrial proletariat, in reality has grown rapidly. The 500 largest international supermonopolies alone employed 25 million workers in 1990. In 2017, the figure was 68 million. In Germany, too, the workers form the largest class. This is usually covered up, for example, by counting workers in statistics as service providers. However, a mechanic remains a worker, whether exploited in an industrial enterprise, at an airport, or as temporary stuff. As Mason's logic goes, the working class also has no more right to an ideology of its own. What Engels wrote about state-supporting philosophers fits Masons to a T. 
The old fearless zeal for theory has now disappeared completely. Inane eclecticism and an anxious concern for career and income, descending to the most vulgar job hunting, occupy its place. Only among the working class does the aptitude for theory remain unimpaired. Here it cannot be exterminated. Here there is no concern for careers, for profit making or for gracious patronage from above. On the contrary. Even 200 years after Engels' birth, there are still workers and capitalists, still exploitation, still class struggle. I cordially invite those who don't want to believe this to have a chat with my colleagues from the steel mill. Bourgeois theories and practices, the prohibiting of flags of the Marxist-Leninist party, for example, deny workers the right to organize themselves for their class interests and to fight for them. Ultimately, this serves to keep the workers in their oppressed position. The working class exists, and for its interests, it therefore needs its own world outlook and organization, its own theory and party. That is why the Marxist-Leninist Party of Germany, the MLPD, has its main fighting line in large enterprises in industry, logistics and communications, in industrialized centers of the social services, health and education sectors. The working class must become conscious of its role. For that, it must free itself from the bourgeois world outlook, the petty bourgeois mode of thinking, the influence of bourgeois parties and their theories. Then it will be able to free itself also politically from exploitation and oppression in capitalism, develop its class independence build up its revolutionary party, firmly rooted among the masses, and overcome capitalism by revolutionary action. That is why the workers today must embrace Engels' life work. Engels lives in the era of the transition from feudalism to capitalism. Together with the relations of production, the entire superstructure changes radically. This means the legal and political institutions, the worldview, the ideas and science. Everything is in motion. For Engels too, as child and youth, he is still religious and impresses school teachers with his knowledge of the Bible. But he experiences how his father and other capitalists in Wuppertal preach brotherly love on Sundays in church, but ruthlessly exploit the workers on weekdays. And so his philosophical reflections begin with the critique of religion. His friend Karl Marx sums it up later. Instead of the illusory happiness of the people, this is what he calls religion, he demands real happiness. At the age of 19, Engels concerns himself with Georg Wilhelm Friedrich Hegel, the greatest philosopher of rising German capitalism. Hegel's doctrine is a groundbreaking advance, which Willi Dicku describes in this way. Herein precisely lies the revolutionary kernel of the Hegelian philosophy. There can be no finality, no fixed state of human thinking and action, but everything is in motion, in flux, in development. But Hegel is an idealist. To him, reality merely is the product of ideas which existed prior to the real and material world. The idealist worldview is briefly summed up in the biblical story of creation. In the beginning was the word. Engels raises the question. Which is primary, spirit or nature? Did God create the world or has the world been in existence eternally? And he answers. The answers which the philosophers gave to this question split them into two great camps. Those who asserted the primacy of spirit to nature and therefore in the last instance assumed world creation in some form or other comprised the camp of idealism. The others who regarded nature as primary belonged to the various schools of materialism. And the time was ripe to settle the basic philosophical question. The traditional anti-scientific conception of the world 
with the medieval dogmas of the church increasingly is shaken in the 18th and 19th century by modern industry and scientific discoveries. In astronomy, geology, anatomy, chemistry, physics or biology, humanity learns to grasp the material reality of nature in a scientific way. Materialism and dialectics find their way into science. This is a tremendous advance. However, primitive materialism often still is rigid and unhistorical and initially cognizes only the mechanical laws of motion, such as that of cause and effect. Engels describes it as simply metaphysical, exclusively mechanical materialism. Engels sees the movement, the development, and realizes that further progress in natural science only can be achieved with the aid of dialectics. Marx and Engels embraced the great advances achieved by the materialist critic of religion Ludwig Feuerbach as well as the ideas of Hegel's dialectics. They rid Feuerbach's materialism of metaphysics and Hegel's dialectics of idealism. They develop the dialectical method and apply it materialistically to nature, society and human thought. They turn Hegel's dialectics off its head and place it on its feet, giving birth to the groundbreaking science of historical and dialectical materialism. This materialist dialectics for years has been our best working tool and our sharpest weapon, say Marx and Engels. With an insatiable zeal for research, Frederick Engels applies it to the tremendous mass of positive material for knowledge provided by natural science in his day. His work, Dialectics of Nature, sums up that in nature the same dialectical laws of motion force their way through as those which in history govern events. The same laws which similarly form the thread running through the history of the development of human thought. Concerning the unity of humanity and nature, he wrote, Thus, at every step, we are reminded that we by no means rule over nature like a conqueror over a foreign people, like someone standing outside nature, but that we, with flesh, blood and brain, belong to nature and exist in its midst, and that all our mastery of it consists in the fact that we have the advantage over all other creatures of being able to learn its laws and apply them correctly. The notion that humanity and nature form a dialectical unity thus became a principle of Marxism-Leninism from the very outset. With brilliant foresight, Marx and Engels made the ecological question a fundamental issue of scientific socialism. Today, too, there is an abundance of pioneering new discoveries. We could make a comprehensive closed-loop economy based on renewable energy possible, for example. In imperialism, however, natural science is dominated by the metaphysical idealist worldview. It prevents recognizing the big picture and consequently cannot contribute to progress and to the solution of the most urgent problems of humankind. Instead, any advance is subordinated to the profit interests of the international monopolies. For instance, at present the production of batteries for billions of cars is being ramped up, resulting in immense damage to the environment instead of developing an alternative transport system. The world today thus is heading towards a global environmental catastrophe involving the deadly risk of destroying all foundations of human existence. I am firmly convinced the materialist dialectics of Frederick Engels is highly up to date and absolutely needed. After the death of Marx and Engels, contrary to their views, the environmental question was underestimated for many years in the international working class movement. This already began with the Gotha Congress of the Social Democratic Party in 1875, to which a draft program was submitted that called labor the source of all wealth and ignored natural materials. Immediately, Marx and Engels sharply criticized this economistic draft, but a formal correction is made only 16 years later at the vigorous urging of Engels. The SPD leaders refrain from principled self-criticism with serious consequences. The present-day Monopoly Party SPD even systematically plays off the working class and environmental movements against each other. 
The MLPD has helped to raise awareness in the international revolutionary and working class movement of Engels' knowledge of the dialectics of nature, of the fundamental unity of humanity and nature. This was a contribution to include this in its programmatic foundations and further develop its practice in this spirit. Stefan Engels' book, Catastrophe Alert, What is to be done against the willful destruction of the unity of humanity and nature, thus systematically proves that preventing a global environmental catastrophe today has become a matter of the survival of humanity. Since its main causes lie in the capitalist profit economy, the environmental question today requires a society-changing struggle. In the beginning of the 19th century, utopian, ecstatic ideas of socialism emerge. Engels deals with them and examines their feasibility. Their creators, Saint-Simon, Fourier and Owen recognize the emerging conflict between working class and capitalist class. They devise projects and factories to deliver workers from misery. All shall share equally in wealth and women and men shall be equal. Engels acknowledges the world historical significance of these ideas and takes up all progressive thoughts. But at the same time, he criticizes their idealism because these utopian ideas are to be realized explicitly without any class struggle. While the utopians denounce the injustices of capitalism, they do not provide any scientifically based criticism of it. To this day, anti-communism leaves room for utopian ideals or fragments of a classless society. As long as they remain abstract and idealistic, from the perspective of the ruling class, there is no danger of their implementation. Engels therefore recognizes, To make a science of socialism, it had first to be placed upon a real basis. Scientific socialism embraces essential great discoveries. The revelation of the secret of capitalist production, the doctrine of surplus value, the materialist conception of history, the materialist dialectics and the dialectical method. Engels sums up the doctrine of surplus value. It was shown that the appropriation of unpaid labor is the basis of the capitalist mode of production and of the exploitation of the worker that occurs under it, that the capitalist extracts more value from it than he paid for, and that in the ultimate analysis this surplus value forms those sums of value from which are heaped up constantly increasing masses of capital in the hands of the possessing classes. Now as before, the worker must sell the capitalist his labor power as a commodity. So it is a sham when the SPD runs in elections with the slogan good money for good work or for just wages. Today too, the capitalist wage system is based on exploitation and does not reward good work. Bourgeois historians and economists say exploitation now only is practiced by subcontractors, for instance in slaughterhouses. Other than that, it allegedly no longer occurs in Germany. But what is the reality? All values created by the worker are appropriated by the capitalist. Only a small part is paid to the worker as wages. The capitalist privately appropriates the surplus value created beyond that. That, precisely, is exploitation. And Marx and Engels already prove that exploitation actually increases with growing productivity. In the German automotive industry, the turnover per employee rose between 1997 and 2017 from 220,000 euros to 570,000 euros. This means that the German car monopolies extracted 160% more per employee. The industrial workers thus produce enormous social wealth, which, however, is privately appropriated by a small stratum of solely ruling international finance capital. Therefore, higher wages must be fought for. Ultimately, however, the workers must take up the cause of abolishing exploitation and oppression. That is why Marx and Engels demanded abolition of the wages system.
Marx and Engels write about the materialist conception of history. The history of all hitherto existing society is the history of class struggles. In his book Socialism, Utopian and Scientific, Engels writes about how the materialist conception of history was developed by driving idealism out of it. From that time forward, socialism was no longer an accidental discovery of this or that ingenious brain, but the necessary outcome of the struggle between two historically developed classes, the proletariat and the bourgeoisie. Marx and Engels themselves can witness the proof that they are right. On 18th of March 1871 in Paris, It is the workers' armed uprising and seizure of power. It is the Commune of Paris. This is the first practical attempt at a socialist society. Expropriation of large factories, workers' wages for the employees of the Commune, equality for women, these are just a few of the great achievements. Engels and Marx criticize a serious error of the heaven stormers, as they call the communards. They were too good natured and not determined enough to suppress the enemies of freedom and to take the national bank out of their hands immediately. The counter revolution uses this to gather all forces against the detested commune. The bourgeois French government joins forces with the arch enemy Prussia. The civilization and justice of the bourgeoisie now stand forth as undisguised savagery and lawless revenge, murdering thousands of workers. After 72 days, the Paris Commune is bloodily defeated. However, the long-standing head of the Engels house in Wuppertal, Eberhard Illner, wants to castrate Engels politically. Engels class warrior? No way. It is the tragedy of both Marx and Engels that they were appropriated by different political systems, including totalitarian regimes. Were Engels still alive today, he would be one of the leaders of the Greens. What a wretched attempt to co-opt Engels. Modern anti-communists obtrusively seek to construct a contradiction between a few fragments of the positions of Engels and Marx and their general teachings, and above all, a contradiction to the theory and practice of Lenin, Stalin or Mao Zedong. The intention is to present Marx and Engels as tame and label Lenin, Stalin and Mao as totalitarian monsters. Marx and Engels are no more tame than Lenin, Stalin and Mao are monsters. Rather, Marx and Engels drew revolutionary lessons from the suppression of the Paris Commune, which were shared, taken into account and realized by Lenin, Stalin and Mao Zedong. Following the Paris Commune, Marx observed, After Whitsunday, 1871, there can be neither peace nor truth possible between the working men of France and the appropriators of their produce. They draw the lesson. The working class cannot simply take possession of the old state machinery, but must smash it and establish the dictatorship of the proletariat. The working class must oppress the capitalist class and take away its ability to resume its business of exploitation. For the great masses of the population, the dictatorship of the proletariat means unprecedented democracy and freedom, enabling more and more people to develop socialist consciousness. Thus, they learn to govern the state and take responsibility for the whole of society. The dictatorship of the proletariat will only be made superfluous by communism. Classes and the state will then wither away. Today, the United Socialist States of the world are already materially prepared, comprehensively and on an international scale. Socialism has long ceased to be a utopia, but is a science. That is why anti-communism as state religion 
is used to prevent the working class and the broad masses from drawing this necessary revolutionary conclusion and to deter them from socialism. That is why we need a social movement, don't give anti-communism a chance, which fights anti-communism and seeks to ostracize it in society. This movement will ensure the possibility of an unreserved discussion about socialism. I am confident humankind will take this next step forward in social development and struggle to achieve genuine socialism. The scientific method of proletarian polemics was developed in the struggle against the bourgeois ideology of capitalism. It is scientific debate sharply conducted for the sole purpose of creating clarity. Without polemics, there would be no Marxism-Leninism, no light in the darkness of the confusion created by the bourgeois worldview and manipulation. Without polemics, the revolutionaries cannot give the masses the help they need to know what is what. In Wikipedia, which meanwhile in many of its explanations is a platform for anti-communism, polemics is demonized. In the German entry, its goal is said to be to assert one's own opinion even if in substance it does not correspond or only partially corresponds to reality. Based on such distortions, reservations against polemics have developed in society. Polemics is personal hostility, it is said. It is better to seek harmony and avoid contradiction, and so on. Stefan Engel, on the other hand, writes in a conspectus on scientific polemics in 2019. Scientific polemics exposes the bourgeois swindle of the dampening of the class struggle. Scientific polemics must deal with every detail of the opponent's assertions, refute them point for point, and then go on the offensive and make a decisive counterattack. That distinguishes scientific polemics from the commentaries of petty bourgeois and bourgeois opinion makers who often only seek to arouse compassion in their statements, for example on the intensifying environmental crisis, and so obscure the chief causes keeping the public in the dark about who is primarily responsible. Frederick Engels is a master of polemics and further developed it as a scientific method in an equally fundamental and entertaining way. A polemic masterpiece is his writing, Herr Eugen Düring's Revolution in Science, anti Düring for short. It appeared in 1877 as a serial in 35 issues of the then still revolutionary newspaper of the SPD, Vorwärts. In the social democratic press of that time, all sorts of representatives of a supposedly necessary modernization or updating of socialism aired their views. That, however, was nothing other than the attempt to rob Marxism of its revolutionary content and tone it down to make it conform to the system. In the 1870s, Professor Eugen Düring pompously set out as reformer of socialism to develop a whole system of new socialist theory. His idealist constructs throw the entire progress of knowledge of the working class movement and the natural sciences overboard. In his work, Engels patiently picks to pieces every argument and every assertion of Düring, convincingly substantiates the positions of scientific socialism on the issues and, summing up, polemicizes. Freedom of science is taken to mean that people write on every subject which they have not studied and put this forward as the only strictly scientific method. Herr Düring, however, is one of the most characteristic types of this bumptious pseudoscience which in Germany nowadays is forcing its way to the front everywhere and is drowning everything with its resounding sublime nonsense. Sublime nonsense in poetry, in philosophy, in politics, in economics, in historiography. Sublime nonsense in the lecture room and on the platform. Sublime nonsense everywhere. Sublime nonsense, which lays claim to a superiority and depth of thought. Sublime nonsense, the most characteristic mass product of Germany's intellectual industry. Cheap, but bad. Just like other German-made goods. Engels' polemic against Düring strikes like a bombshell. After the publication of the first articles, opinions differ sharply. Testimonies of bright enthusiasm contrast with signs of helpless outbursts of rage of the during followers. But Engels' polemics is always constructive 
and makes use of the critical analysis to develop Marxism. I was compelled to follow him, Mr. Döring, wherever he went and to pose my conceptions to his. As a result, my negative criticism became positive. The polemic was transformed into a more or less connected exposition of the dialectical method and of the communist world outlook, championed by Marx and myself. This polemic was so convincing, so effective, that in the public perception to this day nothing more remains of Eugen Düring than the anti-Düring. Scientific polemics is at the heart of the advanced skirmish in which we currently have to engage in the field of ideology in today's historical period of transformation from capitalism to socialism. The method of polemics requires that we expose the antagonistic, that is, irreconcilable class contradiction, make it utterly clear in order to help people decide in favor of the proletarian class standpoint. Exactly for that reason, it is a great help in really coming fully to grips with the influence of bourgeois ideology. Polemics is always a constructive attack, not backward-looking, but oriented to the future, to the clarification of contradictions. Polemics thus also is the mark of a basic revolutionary attitude, because this proletarian class standpoint must swim against the stream. It encounters opposition, and I must be able to argue itself confidently and with complete conviction, and then assert it. Karl Marx and Frederick Engels are the founders of the proletarian women's movement. In 1884, Engels wrote the book The Origin of the Family, Private Property and the State. For this he drew upon extensive conspectuses by Marx of the works of Lewis Henry Morgan, the explorer of human history. Engels' discovery of the twofold conception of production is groundbreaking. He himself wrote, The social institutions under which men of a definite historical epoch and of a definite country live are conditioned by both kinds of production, by the stage of development of labor on the one hand and of the family on the other. Thus every epoch of history is conditioned by the inseparably connected stages of development of labor on the one hand and of the family on the other. Since Engels, this has been one of the fundamental concepts of Marxism-Leninism. With the polemical treatise, New Perspectives for the Liberation of Women, in 1999 the MLPD rediscovered Engels' twofold conception of production, which had been largely repressed in the women's and working class movements. While Marx and Engels are interested in the relations of people, Capitalist economists are only interested in the most profitable exchange of commodities. That is why the production of goods such as cars or clothings is socially organized today on an ultra-modern level. But for wage workers to come to work day after day, more or less refreshed, well-fed and healthy, for new generations of workers to be born, nourished and educated, for old and sick people to be cared for, This automatically is assumed to be the task of private families, especially women. Herein lies the cause of double exploitation and oppression of the mass of women and the general special oppression of women in capitalism for reason of their sex. The bourgeois state and family system is intended to maintain these conditions. The state is exclusively the state of the ruling class and in all cases remains essentially a machine for keeping down the oppressed, exploited class. According to Frederick Engels. The bourgeois state also creates the necessary laws and institutions and encourages bourgeois traditions and notions of morality in order to assign women their role in capitalist society. The result is chronically low wages, economic dependence on the husband, poverty for single mothers or an old age, the ordeal of bearing the entire responsibility for children, care and a good atmosphere in the family, moral pressure against a self-determined life of women, especially against revolutionary political activity by women. 
Marxist and Engels' views on women's liberation spark an outcry among the bourgeoisie, that is, the capitalists as well as the nobility and the church. Now the communists are calling not only for rebellion against exploitation, but also for rebellion against the oppression of women. Maintaining and defending the oppression of women became an integral element of anti-communism from then on. Under capitalism, for the workers and the broad masses, the family is a community of solidarity. Otherwise, it often could not cope with the complexities of life in present-day society. But in socialism, the family gradually will be relieved of its character as smallest economic unit. Relations between men and women and in the families then will be based exclusively on voluntariness, affection and love. Engels summarizes briefly and concisely what is fundamental to the liberation of women. It is my conviction that real equality of women and men can come true only when the exploitation of either by capital has been abolished and private housework has been transformed into a public industry. Engels convincingly demonstrates already at that time how much easier life would be for women and how much more productive society would be if there were free and high quality laundries, canteens or nurseries in every neighborhood. He proves the ultimate liberation of women is only possible by overthrowing capitalism and building socialism. His theory is an antipole to economism in the working class movement which only deals with workplace-related issues and treats the women's question as a secondary contradiction. The communist ideology of freedom encompasses people's entire lives. Engels implements his understanding of the role of women also in his personal life. In England, he meets the Irish worker Mary Burns, who was employed in one of his father's factories. The courageous woman, who could neither read or write at the time, allows him access to the miserable living quarters of Irish workers and introduces him to the secret discussion circles. This class-conscious woman, a worker and fervent revolutionary, becomes his beloved partner. Despite all bourgeois conventions, she accompanies him on trips and to conferences, much to the chagrin of the Engels family in Wuppertal. Marx and Engels, in all their famous writings, also laid the foundations of a socialist children and youth policy which goes hand in hand with the liberation of women. To this day, anti-communists hypocritically insist that children must not be influenced. Their influence, of course, is accepted from this rule. They are outraged that the children's organization of the MLPD, the Red Foxes, also demands and realizes a social education of children. We recommend that these people read the polemics of Marx and Engels in the Communist Manifesto. The communists have not invented the intervention of society in education. They do but seek to alter the character of that intervention and to rescue education from the influence of the ruling class. At the suggestion of Marx and Engels, from the very start the International Working Men's Association also fights for the rights of working class children and youth. It drafts a proletarian concept of socialist education. They are convinced that the education of young people must consist of intellectual education, physical exercise and polytechnic training that initiates the child and young person in the practical use and handling of the elementary instruments of all trades. In schools today, young people often do not learn even the simplest practical everyday skills. In contrast, the ideological foundations of Marxist pedagogy are based on uniting mental and manual work and thus on an education of young people that produces well-rounded personalities. Engels supports making this a task of the whole society. The double exploitation of working women and the special oppression of all women have not yet disappeared today. But according to the prevailing opinion, this is our personal problem. We are supposed to solve all these social problems by ourselves and see to it that we reconcile family and job. The social causes in capitalism are hidden and denied. Millions of women worldwide fight against this, linked together in a rebellious and lively women's movement. 
and all the while the idea is spreading that the liberation of women and the liberation of the working class go hand in hand. So whoever is looking for new perspectives for the liberation of women definitely should look into Frederick Engels. We are proud to live in Engels home region. There are still a few diehards in Wuppertal who condemn Frederick Engels as one who fought his own nest. However, for us Engels' personality, his life decisions and his practical and theoretical achievements and contributions to the working class movement serve as a role model now as before. Frederick Engels grew up in Barmen, which now is part of Wuppertal. Barmen belonged to the so-called Manchester of the Rhineland, the most industrially developed area in Germany at the time. Not averse to using the cane, his father wants to raise the eldest son to inherit the company. But the son decides on his path himself. In Manchester, he establishes first contacts with workers' clubs. With his modest manner, he wins the trust of the workers and makes a life decision. He leaves his previous place in the capitalist class and sides with the working class. Such a change of class standpoint is a nightmare to anti-communists. Re-education is to their mind brainwashing. And the renunciation of an existence as capitalist son is for them tantamount to the ascetic renunciation of all joy in life. But Engels turns the tables on them. He heaps ridicule and mockery on the world outlook and stuffy morality of the bourgeois and petty bourgeois. To him, a life at the side of the working class enhances his joy of life. A contemporary writes about him. Weekdays he lived a very simple life, but on Sundays it was a pleasure to see how he enjoyed having his friends around him, regaling with them with the best he could get. One can say that Engels was one of the most obliging people in the world. His very presence had a stimulating effect. That is also true of his indomitable courage and his optimism. In a letter to August Bebel and other leaders of the SPD, Marx and he write that also people from other classes join the working class. From them they demand If people of this kind from other classes joined the proletarian movement, the first condition must be that they should not bring any remnants of bourgeois, petty bourgeois, etc. prejudices with them, but should wholeheartedly adopt the proletarian outlook. No sooner said than done. Engels merges with the working class for the rest of his life. He not only becomes a teacher and leader of the workers, but at the same time absorbs their best character traits their values of solidarity, fighting spirit, toughness. Another contemporary states, The workers loved and revered Frederick Engels as a friend already during his lifetime. Engels is a man of many talents. He always loved the company of youth. He is a passionate sportsman. He swims, rows, rides. He draws, writes poems and plays, is enthusiastic about the music of Beethoven. The turning point towards becoming a proletarian class fighter is his encounter with Karl Marx, two years his senior, in 1844. They sit together for days on end in Paris, where Marx had to emigrate to. They work on all controversial issues of philosophy and politics and gradually create a common ideological platform. A deep and lifelong friendship develops. After the defeat, of the 1848 bourgeois revolution in Germany, Marx and his family had to emigrate to England. Engels follows him. For 20 years, Engels performs what he calls compulsory labor in his father's factory in order to support the bitterly poor Marx family financially. He thus enables Marx to work as a full-time professional revolutionary. Without this, Marx could not have accomplished his earth-shaking work. Engels is a friend anyone would want to have. When Marx's beloved nine-year-old son Edgar died, Marx wrote to Engels. Amid all the fearful torments I have recently had to endure, 
The thought of you and your friendship has always sustained me, as has the hope that there is still something sensible for us to do together in the world. Since personal meetings between Marx and Engels are possible only to a limited extent, Engels lives in Manchester and Marx in London, more than 1,500 letters have been preserved. They are proof of a highly unified mode of thinking. They debate, reach agreement on issues, inform one another and are always concerned for the other's welfare and family. The youngest Marx daughter, Eleanor, reports. One of the first things I remember is the arrival of letters from Manchester. The two friends wrote to each other almost every day and I can remember how often more, as we called her father at home, used to talk to the letters as though their writer were there. No, that's not the way it is. You're right there, etc. But what I remember best is how more used sometimes to laugh over Engels' letters until tears ran down his cheeks. On Sundays, there are often picnics in the park, outings and parties. Together with other families and the wife and the children of Karl Marx, who love Uncle Frederick dearly. Even in most difficult situations, the friends retain their optimistic joie de vivre and an irrepressible sense of humor. Despite all scientific precision, Engels is not afraid to make a coarse joke or say hard words about opponents. For instance, when he curses about the shitty positivism of a renowned scientist. Marx's daughters put a set of questions to Frederick Engels for their autograph book. He answers in simple words. Your favorite virtue? Jollity. Idea of misery? To go to a dentist. The vice you detest? Can't. Motto? Take it easy. Frederick Engels dies on the 5th of August 1895 at the age of 75. He does not want a tomb. The urn with his ashes is buried at sea on a stormy autumn day off the coast near Eastbourne, his beloved vacation spot. Lenin writes in his obituary for Engels. The services rendered by Marx and Engels to the working class may be expressed in a few words, thus They taught the working class to know itself and be conscious of itself, and they substituted science for dreams. He characterizes Engels' personality in these words. This stern fighter and austere thinker possessed a deeply loving soul. <laughs>